Hello, Argyle. <laughs> so hi and welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's webinar for April. My name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host for this evening. Um, just bear with me, I'm trying to multitask. I've usually got Christine with me to help out. Um, so I'm trying to let people in as well as um, make sure that I cover everything for you tonight as well. Um, so we would be obliged if you would keep your cameras and your sound off until the presentation is over. It just helps by keeping the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can enjoy the webinar without any delays or any screens freezing or anything as well. Um, I know some of you have started already by popping a note into the chat box, uh, but if you haven't already, tell us where you're watching from today. And if you're excited, uh, researching something exciting, then tell us what you're, you're working on at present as well. Um, Christine, and, Christine isn't with us, she's actually um, just Kate arrived I think this morning in Scotland uh, with one of her research trips and Christine and myself will actually be running the, let me just try and share my screen, the, where are we, the Kilted Ancestors summer sessions. So these actually will take part during the month of July and it's on um, Mondays. So it starts on Monday, the 10th of July and I'll be doing a presentation on getting organized with Trello. So a great way to organize your research. 17th, Christine will be talking about blogging your family history, which is something that she does quite regular. 24th, I will be doing Pinterest for genealogy. And on the 31st, it will be storing, organising and sharing your family memories. Um, there is a little video on the website which explains more. I will share a link into the, the chat box for where you can register for it. Um, it's £10 for all four sessions, so less than the price of a coffee for each session, uh, which works out, I think, about 17 Canadian dollars or 12 US dollars, so a bargain. Um, and it's going to be quite interactive as well. We're going to have people talking about what they're working on themselves, uh, what they use some of these um, software programs for, what they blog about. Um, so yeah, it's going to be very uh, interactive and we're really looking forward to it as well. Um, what else have we got on the agenda? So if you're not already a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, why not join now? Annual membership ranges from £10. You will receive three journals per year, a monthly e-news and also use of the Society's Research Centre in Motherwell. Somebody else coming in. Um, I'll pop some details into the chat for the website and you can go in there and actually have a look um, about what the, the Society has to offer. Um, the next Allied Air Force Research Webinar event is on Wednesday the 26th of April. Um, it's by David Nelson, who will provide a presentation titled An Example of a United States um, Army Air Force Heavy Bomber Airfield in World War II Suffolk. So if you're in the US and you have a, an interest in the US Air Force during World War II, this one's for you. I'll put some details for that into the chat box as well, and it is free to attend. Um, the next thing that I've got to share with you, let me just share my screen, is the, the Bygone Con event in East Colbride. So this takes place on Saturday the 29th of April, and it's between 10 and 4pm. It's a free event. It's the second one that South Lanarkshire Libraries have organised. They have um, various organisations with tables and they also have a range of talks. Uh, Lanarkshire Family History Society will be there and I will also be there with um, some artefacts from the Allied Air Force research side of my business. So if you're in the area and you can pop along, come and have a chat with us, we would love to see you. Okay, I've got so many windows open here now. Um, so, moving on, our speaker um, for this evening is Angela Day. Angela is a brand and headshot photographer based in Hamilton. Um, like a lot of entrepreneurs, she's uh, got her, her finger in a lot of pies, so to speak. Um, she's also a holistic coach where she loves helping people work through their own stories to help them understand themselves better. 
This curiosity of the story has developed into a keen interest in her own family tree. And over the past decade, she's been on the hunt for family photos and new and fun ways to showcase the many photos that she's discovered. During her presentation, um, which is titled Showcasing Your Family Photos in the Best Light, Angela will share some photography tips, a guide to scanning and making minor repairs to images, as well as providing options on ways you might wish to display your images um, so that you can language, they don't language on languish on hard drives, which I'm sure a lot of us do nowadays, or phones, never to see the light of day again. Um, you can place any questions for Angela into the chat box or you can unmute yourself at the end and ask any questions. So Angela, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. It's lovely to see you. So oh, if you're ready, I'll get going. <laughs> yeah, I'll hand over to you. So I will just share my screen when I find the right button. There we go. And there's no sound, so I don't have to click those buttons. So that should be the right screen coming up. No, so hopefully you can all see that. That's so awesome. thank you very much for that lovely introduction. That saved me about the first two or three bullet points of what I was going to say. So that's that's quite useful. Um, so yeah, so I'm Angela. I'm a headshot and brand photographer, and I've got lots of different hats that I that I wear depending on what I'm doing. And, and holistic therapy is my other big big aspect. So yeah, I'm talking about showcasing your family photos in the best light. So might as well get started. Let's have a quick look. Actually, this is not the slide that should have been first, but that's fine. I was going to say here was what we were going to talk about from from the screen, but that's cool. So taking photos, let's look at the photos that you are taking now. Most of us have one of these lovely little phones in our pockets of whatever variety, and they've got a camera on them. The best for the best camera that you have is the one that's with you. So whether you've got big SLRs, which I've got. We've got one over here, whether you've got compact cameras, whatever you whatever you've got, if you've not got it on you, not much use. So learn how to use what's actually in your hand or in your pocket or your handbag, preferably not down your bra straps, ladies, and actually use what you've got um, with you. Because at the end of the day, it's better to get the image than not and miss that experience and capturing that memory. But the biggest thing I always say, and if you remember nothing else, clean the lens. The amount of times I've seen people complaining about the fact that their photos are a bit hazy, a bit grubby, they don't quite know why they've got this strange haze over them, it's because they've not cleaned the lens. I don't know about you, but that goes in my pocket, it goes in my handbag, it gets dropped on the couch when I get home. It, I don't I actually take as much effort and care of, of those lenses as I do of my camera, which has got a nice case on it and a cover on it and everything else. So clean it. And you'd, you'd be amazed at how much of a difference that little bit of, of TLC can actually make to the photos that you take. And whether you want to use a nice lint-free cloth or one of these little tools and gadgets, go for it. I'm quite bad. I tend to use my finger on my jumper. So um, so far, it's not done any major harm. But that's that's if you don't remember anything else about photography, that to me is the biggest thing to remember is just to give that a good clean. One thing to remember as well with taking photos with your phone is the difference between digital and optical zooms. So I've now got one of these that have got three different lenses on it. So these are all got different optical zooms. So I've got a 0.5, I've got a one and I've got a three. If you actually open the camera up, and you're now going to get a nice close up of me as, if I, as I turn it around. If you actually zoom in, you can see, oh, there, there we go. We've got a close up of my curtains behind me. That's now at six and a half times zoom. What you're doing there is you're reducing the number of pixels that you're, you're capturing. So if you are going to use your phone camera, don't, don't rely on the zoom because all you're doing is getting less of the detail of the image and you end up with it being all really, really grainy and and there's not a lot of detail in there. So, so that's always a good one to remember. If you can move, walk yourself forward, walk yourself back. Obviously that depends on where you are and, and obviously making sure that you're, you're not walking into traffic. But if you can move yourself around to get that little bit closer to whatever you're shooting, that's a preferred option to, to zooming in with that manual way. Um, obviously, as I said, you've got the, the different cameras, I've got the different options. 
the op, op, optical zooms is the one you don't want digital um, i've got, got the wrong way around optical zoom is the one you want so if it is if it's got the three cameras or however many cameras you've got that's perfectly fine but it's when you start to zoom in and that's when it starts to lose the detail and don't be stingy how much space have you got on one of these i don't know about anybody else i the last time I gave a talk like this, I had 30,000 photos and it was only one six months ago. I've now got 35,000 photos on my phone. I've got a lot of images on here. So there's no point in being stingy. If you don't like the shot, delete it afterwards. But you don't know what you've got until you get home and have a play with it. So just keep pressing the button. And if you're like my nieces and nephews, when they grab a hold of my phone, they find this option where if you press the button and you don't take your finger off the button, you get lots and lots of images and big bursts of photos and suddenly you've got 100 pictures up your nephew's or your child's nose. Not really what you want, but you can delete afterwards. And that's that's the big thing as to, to what I wanted to be really clear on. So don't be stingy. Take as many shots as you think you might need and then take a couple extra to be on the safe side. Oh, so that was the slide that was supposed to be in there, but that's fine. <laughs> Moving on to flash. Do you flash? Do you not flash? These ones, they can be hit and miss as to whether they're actually good to use. I tend to find that I'd rather not use the flash in most situations. But again, we're not being stingy. We can do it both ways. You might find that the, the flash is only good for a certain distance away from where you're actually taking the photo. And then it just ends up with a, a really strange effect. So if you can take it without the flash, if you've got a nice steady hand, that would be a preferred option. I know that my latest one, it now does a one second thing, so it tells you to hold it really, really steady. If you're not great at that, you can get tripods to actually put the phone onto. This one's not got the right adapter for the phone, but you can get those as well. Um, or you can get a selfie stick and actually hold it really tight so you've got, or against a, a wall or something. So there's there's options there um, to actually make sure that you're not having too much of a, of a camera shake when you're taking the photos. So that's that's a really good one to remember when you're thinking about is there enough light, is there not? And actually, if there's not enough light, you can sometimes fix that afterwards. It's not always a lost cause. So don't just delete everything if you think it's rubbish. And remember, you're, you're taking photos to capture memories. You're not looking at potentially winning big, massive prizes. These are for you. These are images that you're going to keep for, for whatever purpose to pass down to, to generations to come beyond you. And actually, how, how nice would it have been for our ancestors to have had phones that took lots of photos to document their lives so that when we then trace them back through our, our history and our records, we had lovely pictures and we could then see what great, great granny looked like, that we maybe don't have that, that option because phones weren't around. And depending on how far back you've gone, cameras weren't around. So do, do your bit for your descendants and take lots of images. Delete the ones that are really bad, but, but have something to, to leave behind as a bit of a legacy. When it comes to accessories, um, what have we got? I have got, as I said, we've got the tripods. These are dead handy. Um, it, it's nice to have, just to have that um, that benefit. This, these, these kind of cleaning things are little accessories that you can or can use if you particularly want to. One of my favourite gadgets that I bought recently is this thing. It's a little thing called a lens hood. How often have you been to museums or on a gondola or on a train or somewhere else and you're taking a photo out the window and you end up with these little circles or squares all over them that look kind of like UFOs and it's just the reflection of the light or you can see yourself in the photo and you maybe don't want that. This little hood, all you do with that, and they're not that expensive, you just clip it onto the phone, make sure the right lens is showing through and that goes against the glass and it cuts out any light coming in from anywhere else. And you get a really nice crisp photo as if the glass wasn't there. So that's that's a really handy thing that that, that to me, that goes in my handbag and I don't tend to leave the house without it. So that's a handy wee gadget. Loads of other gadgets out there. You can get stuff to make you take microscopic photos. So you can take proper zoom photos and it all just clips on the back of the phone. So have a play investigate what's out there, decide what it is you actually want to achieve and, and find the things that suit you for what you need. And, and that it could be a range of apps as well. So there's, there's lots of options out there. Moving on to RAW. Camera RAW is a, is a thing that came out 
maybe about 15 years ago ish maybe not quite as long ago as that and it's it's a much more detailed file so you've got a lot more information a lot more data that you can tweak and play with but what that does is it fills up your phone really quickly and unless you're going to go and do massive editing it's probably not required it's really handy if it is very low light conditions because you can pull a lot more information out of it but other than that if you're not going to go and learn how to edit and do all the bells and whistles it's probably not worth it and I must admit even as a professional photographer I don't have raw switched on on my phone I do have on my camera but I don't have it on on the phone so those are my kind of top tips and, and recommendations from that perspective moving on to composition this bit can be probably one of the most important parts. And it's, it's about being aware of what's in your frame. So you might have seen the old school, the, the photographers would walk around with their, their hands out trying to work out, oh, what's going to be in the frame? You don't need to do that as much. You can just hold it up and see really clearly. What I do have on my camera is the, the rule of thirds. And again, you probably won't see it that clearly, but you can just about make out there's faint grid lines on my camera. And what you want to do is you want to put the focal point on one of those lines. So you'll notice if you look at lots of images, the person's not always bang in the centre. They might be just slightly off and it just gives a little bit more intrigue looking at landscapes, which is my hobby when I'm out and about taking photos for myself is landscapes. So I might put the horizon on the bottom third or I might put the water on the top third or whatever I'm doing it, but they're on those lines. And it just gives that, the photo a little bit more interest. When I was also wanted to talk about rather than just the rule of thirds is the aspects of what's in the frame. So at the moment, I don't have anything grown out my head. How many times have you looked at a photo and somebody's got a plant pot or a lamppost grown out the top of their head? Or you've been somewhere and somebody's put their bag down or there's a bin with overflowing rubbish and you've got a really nice, lovely picture of mum and dad, wherever this bin in the corner and it just kind of ruins the aesthetic of the image so just be aware when you're framing the shot up what else is around it what else is in it what might look a bit ridiculous what might be a pain in the backside to remove later on if you start playing with photoshop or canva or whatever other photo editing software you want to use so just have a think about what's in the frame and does it look good and at the end of the day if it looks good to you that's what matters as, as I said, you're not going out for big, massive competitions here. You're just looking at capturing those memories and capturing nice memories at that practice. I've already said, don't be singy. Take the shot. Take as many shots as you need. Play. Get down low. Get up high. Turn the camera around. I know the, with these ones, if you actually turn it around and take the photo with the, the lens at the bottom, you can get right really close down to the ground and get some really interesting angles and, and play around with it. If it's just people that you're looking at, have a play look for angles do they look good straight on or are they better slightly to the side and, and another aspect of that is that with, with combined with the get creative play have fun and actually think about do you want everybody looking dead center down the, the, the barrel of the lens at you or do you want to catch them in the moment do you want to catch the the candid shots of mum and granny talking to each other or or granddad with, with the, the latest grandbaby and he's pulling his beard or whatever else. You don't necessarily want that posed photo. And if your nieces and nephews are anything like mine, the minute you get the camera out, out comes the biggest, cheesiest, fakest smile possible. And while it's funny in the moment, they might not thank you for it at their 18th birthday party or at the wedding when you bring it back out to embarrass them. So just have a think about that aspect and get creative, have a play, have a practice. So that's the basics of using your phone. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm, I don't want to overwhelm anybody, but I will really briefly talk about the SLRs. So likewise, if you are going to get the big camera out, keep it clean. If you're shooting somewhere really dusty and dirty, it's maybe not just the lens you're going to have to clean. You might have to clean the whole camera. Um, I've, I've got some, some colleagues who work out at Knock Hill and get shots out there. And the amount of time and effort they spend cleaning their camera after a day trip out to Knock Hill gives me the reason not to go and do it because I just don't want to have to have that problem of, of getting the dust out of every little nook and cranny in a camera. So if you can avoid that, um, do. 
But if you do like the idea of going and doing stuff like that, make sure you've got the ability to clean it, whether it's with a fun little brush or a cloth or something that needs to get it cleaned. Again, don't rely on the zoom. The zoom on a camera on a on a an SLR is usually okay, um, but you might not have the lens to get really close up. And it also helps play with your creativity if you move around. If you're using a compact camera, watch out whether it's a digital or an optical zoom because that might trip you up. It's the digital one you don't want. The optical one is the one that actually does the work and keeps as many pixels as possible. So you've got a bigger file when you're finished. Again, the background, watch out for plant pots, watch out for bins that are overflowing in the corner, um, crying babies or having tantrums in the corner if you're looking for a really nice, elegant photo of bride and groom if you're out to somebody's wedding. So it's all that aspect again. And actually, I've covered the pose and the relax. Do you want somebody looking at the camera? Or do you want them nice and relaxed, having a conversation in the moment where you're actually capturing life as it happens and as it unfolds? So there's no right or wrong answers. You're, you're the one that's going to have fun with this and you're the one that's going to have a look at these photos later. So do what's right for you. Again, don't be stingy. Take more than one shot. With these phones, we've got to charge them every other day. With SLRs, we get nice, big, chunky batteries. So if you have got an SLR or a compact camera, Whatever type of batteries you require, keep them charged and keep them handy because it's brilliant having charged batteries at home on the charger and not in your camera bag. So make sure you've got them with you. Likewise with memory cards, you can now get up to a terabyte on a memory card. These ones are 64 gigs, so they're nowhere near as big as that. But I think these are only about 15, 20 pounds now, so they're not a lot of money. And it doesn't do any harm to have a couple of them stuck in your camera bag when you go out and about taking photos. And you can get a heck of a lot of photos on 64 gigs of, of memory cards. So, so those are always worth bearing in mind. When it comes to flash on an SLR, these can get a bit bigger. So this is the flash gun I've got for, um, for, for my camera. And they're, they're nice and editable and move aroundable. If you are going to use a flash on an SLR, I wouldn't recommend the pop-up. If you're going to do it, get something that's off camera or attached above. Um, it just gives that nicer feel. And depending on the size of your lens, you might end up the flash on the pop-up only gets the bottom half of the image because it can't quite get over the top to get the full, the full frame. Likewise with RAW, if you're going to do lots of editing and you're going to get really creative, fantastic, shoot in RAW. My camera's got two camera slots, so on one I shoot in RAW and on one I shoot in JPEG. So I've got the option and I've always got a backup. So have a play around with it. Come into accessories. So I showed you the lens hood for the, the phone. I've got one for the SLR as well. And that goes on the front of it. And you can then take a bit more floppy, but up against a window and you don't end up with those UFOs, which is quite handy. It's a bit more of a hassle to carry around, but it is quite handy. Again, tripods. Um, if you're looking at taking, um, if you're looking at taking photos in manual or on shutter priority, if anyone knows that level of detail, I wouldn't recommend anything less than a sixtieth of a second if you're hand holding. Anything slower than that, pick up the tripod, because even with the best will in the world, there will be some camera shake. I have taken shots slower than that before but I wouldn't put them into competitions and I probably wouldn't print them very big either. So just bearing that in mind, if you're going to shoot in, in manual or shutter priority, try not to go less than a 60th of a second if you're handheld. And if you've got a slight shake in your hand, you might want to have that a higher speed before you switch, switch to a tripod. Right, so that was that's that. And then again, composition, practice and get creative. There's not many differences between your SLRs and your, your phones at the moment. From, from the perspective of what to do with them. So it's just about having fun. You're, as I said, we're not, we're not here looking to, to win some competitions. We're here to capture the memories. We're here to capture those, those, those moments in life where it's nice to look back at and have something to show the grandkids or the great grandkids or I said, whoever comes after. And actually showing the grandparents if they're still around you've got these images and, and when people start to forget things images are great to, to help people remember so those are some basics so moving on from the basics 
to scanning, which is maybe what most of you are probably here for rather than the basics. What can you scan? Any old family photos, any negatives. If you're a little bit older school or you've got boxes of stuff from, from, from past relatives, then you, you maybe have slides, you're going to have newspaper cuttings, any documents. If you've been out to, to go and do the, the Scotland's people and you've downloaded any records, you might not have them on the computer. You might want to actually scan them in. But then you might also be looking at family members that are around and you've got an old box of everything that, that was their life and you want to do something with it rather than having them languishing in that shoebox. So get it scanned. Certificates, ticket stubs, invitations to weddings, to funerals, to well, maybe not invitations to funerals, but invitations to weddings, invitations to christenings, to birthday parties, to engagement parties, to graduations, all these types of things. And then the programmes. So so that's the, perhaps the funeral programme with a pamphlet and whatever else that, that you might have. Basically, if it's paper or something like to paper, you can probably scan it. So moving on to how we scan it. And if I am talking too fast, please tell me to slow down. Um, with a scanner, this is maybe what you might think of when you first think of a scanner. I know this is my first thought when I think of a scanner. And this is just a flat bed, flat bed scanner. But with the advent of all these apps on our phones, we also have things like Adobe Scan, which I'll give a little bit of a, a practice with if I can find a photo, I didn't bring it down with me. Um, you, can get, you can get something like Adobe Scan. Adobe is the company that brought your PDF writers and readers. They, they created or, or they, they sell Photoshop and Lightroom and things like this, which are, are photo editing softwares. So they know their stuff when it comes to digital files. And they're really, really handy. Do you know if you, somebody asks you to send in scanned copies of anything and you don't have a scanner? This is brilliant because if you've got it in your pocket, it's in your pocket. There are other apps out there. So, I'm, and I'm not being paid by Adobe. So, there, there's other options out there. I just know this one's free and I quite like it um, because it's very simple to use. But then you've also got these types of things you're seeing one printers in most cases. That's copy, print, and scan. And I've got something very similar to this at the moment in the house that does all of that for me. Don't use it very often, but it's always there if I do need to have something a little bit more, a little bit more clear and, and maybe not with any shadows or whatever that the Adobe Scan does for me. We've then also got, I don't know where, well, I'm, I'm clicking the wrong way, that's what's happened, sorry. Um, we've then also got dedicated scanners and accessories. So this little thing here, you can put your, your negatives in, you put it through and it just feeds through and scans your negative images. This thing here is a little light box. I think it was about £25. I think this was from Amazon that I got the photos from, but there are other stockists and other shops available. All that does is it puts the light behind the negative that you can then take the photo through Adobe Scan or whatever else you're using to grab that shot. And then this little gadget down here is actually a slide scanner. So you just put all the slides in, fire it through, and it scans the slides individually. And you can then have them on the cloud, on your hard drive, wherever it needs to be, that you can then play with, edit, print, whatever you need. And if you want to go for really old school stuff, and if you found any and you're lucky enough to find them, if you've got any cine film or any Super 8 or whatever else that would require this type of of, of a film, you've got this type of gadget as well that you can actually use to scan straight from film and get that digitised too. There's also services out there that you can send things away to. But if it's not, if you've not got a huge amount, I would recommend looking at Adobe Scan and doing it yourself because it is really simple, really straightforward, and actually quite quick and easy. So that's it for the different types of scanners. And when I was first asked to do a presentation like this by Claire, I had just had someone ask me to take a photo that they had of, I think it was his, 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 his wife's mother and her two sisters. They didn't have many photos of the three of them together. And this was a print out on a bit of paper, so printer paper, and not, not very good quality at that. So they'd lost the original, they'd lost the negative, they'd lost the digital copy. All they had was this little printed out bit of paper. And I was asked, what I could do with it to tidy it up a little bit. So I'm going to show you a little bit. I didn't, I've not got the full finished 
um, shot on here. Um, but what I did do, I, I scanned it using Adobe Scan and I scanned it using my scanner because I wanted to see the difference and I knew that I was going to be presenting something like this. So I wanted to just have that demonstration. So I took the photo, I put it through Adobe Scan, put it through a scanner, and this was the difference. So as you can see, there's there's banding down the side here where the when it's been printed, these kind of black lines, and that's just from the quality of the print. But you can see that there is a difference between the two images. I thought this top one was a little bit crisper to work from, and that's the one I then went on to edit. But this one's got a little bit more contrast to it, and it's a little bit more defined where the blacks and the whites are. So again, it is complete preference as to what you want to do and what you want to edit. It's not a massive difference between these two images, but it was enough for me to decide which one I was wanting to edit. And what I then did was I put it into Canva. So that's C-A-N-V-A dot com. It's a free tool and you can get yourself signed up for that really easily. You can create lots of graphics. You can create documents and workbooks and presentations and presentation you're viewing right now was created in Canva. But one of the beauties of, of Canva is it's got tools in it to allow you to edit. So if you click on an image in Canva, you then get this little pop up box on the, the left hand side where you get to choose what you want to do. You can get it to auto adjust and sometimes that's a pretty good guess. I tend to press that first and then tweak it from there to see what the computer thinks is a good shot and then tweak it. But you can change the temperature. Now you might wonder what I mean by temperature when it comes to photos. Have you ever taken a photo in a sports hall that's got those really, really yellow lights and it just looks as if everybody's a little bit ill when you get the photos back? It's because the temperature of the lights is such that it's not a natural colour and you can just tweak that. So I think if it's a very high number, it's very blue and if it's a very low number, it's yellow. Could be wrong, it could be the other way around. Um, but that's that just allows you to tweak it to balance out. If it's too blue, you turn it a little bit yellow and it'll balance the colour out. And likewise with the tint, these are slightly different shades. You can maybe just a bit make out that it's a purpley colour and a green colour here. Then it comes to brightness. So this is really handy if it's just been that little bit too dark and you've not got a lot of light when you're taking the image, you can brighten it up. I wouldn't go overboard with it. You might get some interesting results and, and little um little kind of grainy marks and, and, and artifacts. That was what I was looking for. You might get some artifacts into the image, which isn't brilliant. So it's always good to have a play, but don't go too overboard. Yes, yeah, so brightness, the contrast, as I mentioned, that's the blacks and the whites as to how much the blacks and the whites are really clear. And then you can play with highlights and shadows and whites and blacks and all these different options. If you do get a chance to play with it, push the sliders as far as they go to see what it does, because that's the best way to learn. You pull it all the way up to the top end. OK, you've almost got a white picture if you're playing with the brightness. You pull it all the way down to the bottom end. You've almost got black. So you just then have that play around and see what works for you. If you then want to play with their presets, you've then got these options here. So this was, um, I think, actually, if I go back one at the top, you've got effects. You've got adjust. This was the adjust panel. And I then went to the effects panel and that was these different options here. So I had a bit of a play and I turned that one black and white. I might have boosted the, co the contrast a little bit more to get a bit more detail, but I think it works OK in black and white. And you can do a little bit more playing around with it and tweaking it. Again, I'm using Canva. This is a free tool. If you choose to upgrade to the paid for Canva, which is about £10 a month, which incidentally is about the same cost as Photoshop and Lightroom, they're about £10 a month as well. Other options are out there. So I think there are a couple of open source um, editors that you can get that don't cost anything or there's something called Affinity that I've heard really good reviews of and that's a one-off cost. But you can have a play with that but for this here I just asked it to remove the background with, with the paid for version of Canva and it's not brilliant around the hair but you can put a nice textured background that's not a picture frame grown out of Auntie's head or a doorway or whatever this is in the background. I think that's actually a mirror behind her so you've got the reflection of the back of her head. So this way you can actually just have a little bit cleaner background and tidy that up. And that's a one button press. So there's options there. They've now brought out a couple of extra tools in Canva that you've now got the option to remove something from the background really quickly and really easily. You just brush over it and it disappears. Um, and you can also 
Um, there's, yeah, there's a couple of other tools that they just brought out, but I think they're all for the paid for version. But it gives you it gives you a chance to play, and if you do want to have a play with it, there's always the free trial to get to get a taste of it to see if you actually want to use that going forwards. Moving on from that, then, and I was going to do a quick demo, but I think we're running out of time a little bit, so I'll, I'll move on very quickly. What do you do with all these photos once you scan them? You can leave them in a hard drive and forget about them. But that's not particularly wonderful. There's lots of different options for printing. I personally, if I'm going to print, I go to a professional print house or I go to Costco. So there's a couple of Costco's around the central bit of Scotland. And if, I think I noticed some of you are out in the States. So you'll have heard of Costco. Their print labs are pretty decent quality. But if that's not an option for you, Asda have got one. Tesco's have got one. Boots have got one. All these different places have got kiosks. In, in the actual store that you can go and grab some prints. You can find a Kodak one that might be slightly better quality, but they're all a much of a muchness these days just to get an image. But what I would like to talk about a little bit before I finish off is the different photo books that you can do. So what I'll do is I'll stop the share and I will demonstrate um, what I'm talking about here. So with my family, we do a lot of stuff together and it's, it's always nice to have photographs. So I started back in 2004, I got a nice little book, which I believe was Asda. So unfortunately they do put the sticker on the back, but it's not a major problem. This was about 10, 15 pounds. And all I did was I took individual headshots of everybody and I just put them all on the page themselves. So you've got the youngsters, you've got the kids in the family, you've got the grandparents, all the aunts and uncles, and everyone's got their own page with their own photo on it. And then what I did five years later was I did the same thing again. And while my family were all sitting down at a wedding for dinner, so everybody's picture was taken at the wedding, except for mine, I wasn't at dinner because someone else took my photo because it was a bit hard to do a selfie with an SLR. And again, it's just a, a, a photo per page of the people. And I think there was a wee one at the end with all the cousins um, all lined up for the, uh, with the wedding, with the bride and groom. So that was five years later. And I think that one was Tesco. And then I did another one that was a slightly different style. Again, getting all the different headshots as you go. And then because the family's got bigger and they keep having more kids, this one's a little bit classy. I've got a nice glossy book on the front and a, a cover and some nice outtakes on the back. But but now you've got, other than me, because I don't have a partner, and I, so I just have a my own page, I made the book. But everybody else has now got to share a, photo, share a page with somebody else. So those things are really handy. They're really nice to see as the family grows up, what people look like. And that's something great to pass down to your kids, your grandkids and whoever else. See, this is this is an event that we all went to and how much fun we had while we were there and what everyone looked like. And put the names on and everything else. Other options are doing something that's slightly bigger. So I did a kind of year in the life of, of photos. So I think this was back from 2003 when I first got a digital camera and was no longer using triple print, if anyone remembers them, where you got your normal size photo and two teeny ones to go with it. So again, I just, all the photos for whatever event I was going to, whether it was a wedding, whether it was a holiday, um, sightseeing, concerts, and I just put the books together. Um, mum, my mum wasn't happy because there wasn't enough of the family and she was a bit too upset that it was all my holidays. And I'm thinking, well, my holidays, my life. <laughs> so, so there's options and you've got different feels and you've got different ways of finishing them off. So I did those quite regularly. And then if you want to get a little bit more excessive, I think these are about 30 or 40 pounds each, depending on how many pages you put in. But then you can go all the way up to this one, I think was from bonus print, as they are now. They were all barely back then. Nice big glossy folder, big book. And it's all, it's, you can get it's open. They're big chunky pages and it lays flat so you can actually see everything there and you can also journal so you can write whatever you like you can talk about what's happening and and actually add all that to a book of that size that was just over 100 pounds so there's lots of different options you can start start really, relatively cheaply my mum does it a book every month she basically uploads it straight from her phone into this app and it only costs for the cost of the postage, which is about four ninety nine. And she gets a little book with about 20 pictures in it every month. And it sits on the coffee table or it goes into a shelf. And she's always got those memories and those things to remember. So it's always worth having something printed out 
not lost and locked away in your computer. So just to wrap it all up, keep it simple. Scan everything. Why not? What have you got to lose? Storage isn't, isn't expensive these days, so you might as well scan it so you've got that digital copy as well as the printed copy. Have fun. Play with it. If in doubt, take another shot and back it up and print it out. And that's me. Thank you for listening. Hopefully that was useful and I didn't talk too fast. Nobody told me off for talking too fast. <laughs> that was amazing, Angela. Thank you so much. Um, one thing I would really like to add is that you told me a long time ago about Adobe Scan. Yes. Now, I actually, I don't know if I've told you this since, but I did put it on my phone. And as you know, I'm the archivist for a squadron association. Mm -hmm. So what we did last year is we went to the annual reunion and we're always looking for information, logbooks, people's letters, stories for the archive. So what I did was I put an announcement out saying, anyone who's got information bring it along to the reunion weekend and i'll scan it so i spent a lot of time in my hotel room <laughs> rather than in Adobe scan. yes and the good thing was that you could actually say right one image right next image next image next image and it would basically save it all as one pdf document so yes. it's not like if you take a, a, a jpeg and then you would need to pull all that together into a pdf it did it all for you and what I noticed was, particularly for the documents, you didn't tend to get any shadows. So yeah. if anyone is going out and they're saying, you know, such and such, you know, my relatives got an old diary or, you know, a load of certificates, I would say Adobe Scan is the way to go over taking an image of it. Absolutely. And, and the other side effect of Adobe Scan or whatever scanning software you've got, we just I just know Adobe Scan because I've used it so much. If you're taking photos of handwriting, yeah. it might not be clear. It might be in a really faded colour. When you use Adobe Scan, you can then tell it, make it black and white, yeah. and then increase the contrast so that you've got really, really black writing. And then Adobe's gotten really clever. You can then say handwriting to text. Right. And in most cases, it'll actually put it into tight proper block capitals or letters or whatever else that's not handwriting that you can't quite make out doesn't get everything perfect but it's actually really handy to start having a play with that and then the beauty of doing that is searching through documentation is much easier because you can do your control f find in the document and find the words that you're looking for so you're looking for any references to daisy or any references to Hamilton or whatever it is you're looking for and you'll be able to find that much easier so there's lots of really good options there and I think when I first told you about it I was looking at taking photos of gravestones yeah and again if you can't quite make out the writing rather than going doing rubbings taking the photo with Adobe scan you can actually pull that detail out which is yeah. phenomenal it's dead easy to use yeah I mean one of the tricks talking about gravestones that, that I've got is when you go to the pound shop or you know a lot of these kind of um budget stores they sell for children the packs of the big chalks okay and the great one of the, the the guys that works in the local cemetery said to me i'll show you a trick to read a gravestone that's really hard to read and he rubbed the chalk on the face and it makes the writing stand out and the thing is that it just the minute the first rain comes or if you it throw washes away. water over it it washes away it doesn't damage the stone Fantastic. So uh, there's, there's ways to do everything, isn't there? always a tip. There's always a trick. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions for Angela? Or any comments? Have you had any success stories yourself or anything you want to share with us? Or any other ways of or displaying your images once you've, once you've taken yeah. them? Yeah, how much is Adobe Scan or is it free? It's free! Yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's free. And you'd be able to, Dallas, you would be able to put it on, so a smartphone or an, a pad, if you've got a pad, it's mm -hmm. an app that you run, so it's really, really easy to get. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if I pull it up, um, well, it's, it's trying to look for a document, let me see if I've got a bit of paper. It's, it's even put the flash on as well, so here we go. Here's a, a bit of scribbled on a bit of paper. I don't think it's anything confidential, so if I take it out, Take the scan. 
and then takes the photo, tells me to hold steady. And then what happens is you get these little, this little blue box all the way around uh -huh. the image. So it's not actually even got the bits around it. Okay, my thumb's in the bottom corner, but if it's not quite got it right, you can move it around. And if you look at that little circle at the corner, it's actually helping you guide exactly to where that bit is. And then when you're done, you just hit continue and that lets you take the next page to put into your document or you hit done. Oh gosh, that's good. Yeah. So and it, and really it does, simple. It just saves, doesn't it? I think it saves into... It the saves into the Adobe Cloud. Yeah. Yeah. So it saves into Adobe Cloud. You can then email it to yourself or you can log into Adobe Scan on your desktop, on your laptop, wherever else, and download it straight from there. Yeah. Oh, they're brilliant. <laughs> Um, so Lisa Marie says thank you very much for the info about the scan. She didn't know about it. Yep, check it out, Lisa Marie. It is definitely a game changer um, yep. when it comes to doing documents. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a name, but it's somebody on a, an Apple iPad it says thank you, Angela. I picked up a, a couple of good points up. You're uh, welcome. Question from Dennis. Um, 100 to 200 actual photos to be digitised. What's the best way to do it? Obviously not individually, one by one. Do you know, no. I have, I... <laughs> <laughs> so don't there's... tell me there's a quicker way. <laughs> there's two options. It is either individually one-to-one, -one, one by one, or if you've got lots and lots of them, outsource it. There's lots of services out there that will do it for you. And I don't know if they've got a quicker way of doing it or they just you just pay them and they do it for you. I've seen companies abroad that do loads of them, but you maybe don't want to send stuff like that abroad. But yeah, there's, there's, there are digitising services local in the UK and, and wherever you are. You just need to search for them. I've not personally used one, but I know of people that have. And I know of people that have done it from VHS to DVD yeah. type things, mm -hmm. because that's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But yeah, it's you, I, I've sat and done hundreds before um, with I've the done, flatbed scanner. I've done it recently because bit. I had a lot of photographs of graves. And I thought, gosh, I need to get, you know, I just didn't want them sitting about in packets anymore. So I sat and actually went through and got everything. And I got all my family history paperwork scanned. And so I've got nothing really paperwork sitting about anymore. Yeah. yeah but always be sure that you back up. That's the tip as well. Back up everything. And, and as I said, don't just leave the photos on a hard drive. Have some way of doing it. I mean, these these books here, I mean, this one, it was a year. So I did a, I did a photo project, but it was a photo a day. So there's only 365 pictures in that. But I've put some of them are, are full page. Some of them are there's there's a lot of journaling on some of it as well. And I think there's some that have even gone across the two pages if I particularly like the photo. Um, so it just depends on what it is and how you want to display it. But you could put six or seven photos per page and get lots into something that size, and you don't have to go anywhere near as big as that. So I think there is another one here of this type that 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 was a 365 one as well. I just obviously went a little bit crazy with the sizing on the, the newer one. Um, and that was just very similar. Um, I think that's a way flat one as well. And I think um, that's a good idea, you know, if you're into photography and you've got particular hobbies, you know, why not set yourself a, you know, it could be I'll do a, a photograph a week or a photograph a day or, you know, or a collection of photographs that you go out doing a bit of research once a month and then you pull them yeah. all together. Um, yeah, it could it could be a theme. I'm going to take a photo of every house in this street that my granny grew up in, or I'm going to go and take front doors because I've got a wee thing I like about the differences of front doors. Whatever, whatever the, the the project you want to do, mm -hmm. but but yeah, don't just leave them on your your phone and your cameras. Yeah. If I cheat to talk, I've had I've got three photo shoots on that camera that I've not taken off yet, so I do need to get some editing done. They're personal projects; they're not client ones. <laughs> um, but I, I do have friends telling me off saying, "Where's my pictures?" Um, so, um, Dennis has also said, do you recommend a certain resolution when digitising photos? Yeah, that's a good question because I've got a scanner and then it says, what DPI do you want it to be? And I'm just like, oh. I tend to go for 300. As high as you can possibly take it is what I always say. What you then do with it afterwards is up to you. But I, I scan as high a resolution as it'll possibly go. It does mean that you then got a lot of files, but you can now pick up a, I don't know if I've got one here. This, this one, I think, is a terabyte hard drive that's that size. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. and you can now get a terabyte on that size. So it just depends on your budget, how how much space you've got. It's an eight terabyte, I think I've got plugged in just now. So yeah, as big as you can possibly go would be always my suggestion. You can always scale down, much more difficult to scale up if you want to print something or crop it down to just a small part of the frame. There's nothing worse than that because I've actually been going through some of my family history stuff and you, you get into this image and you go, oh, and you zoom in and when you zoom in, it's so blurry because the resolution is just not, it's so maddening and you think, I can't read it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, Brian said um, he has a problem coming up with a proper image slash PDF naming convention. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, take it your talk. Well, do you know, if it's documents, just come up with something that you know is you're going to carry on throughout yeah so I tend to do whenever I'm doing something with images I tend to I think it's the Swedish way of dates so I always start with the year first year then month then date as to when it was taken or when you've scanned it probably when it was taken or when the document's from if you've got that information and then if you have to sort it you've always got it in date order that the image was taken on or or that kind of level of detail um, when you're then taking it on from there, the next bit is if you once you've got the date, is what I tend to do. What's the subject matter? If it's photographs, there's so many different tools you can use to add metadata and tags to things. So you can say, well, all of these photos have got trees in them. All of these photos are the Day family. All of these photos, in my case, are the Gandhi family. Whatever it is, where that 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 thing that's really going to tell you what it is. Um, another one of my naming conventions is if it's not necessarily obvious that it's people, right, all these photos were taken at Glasgow Botanic Gardens. So I maybe just put the full date in the six digit or eight digit. Yeah, six or eight digit, depending on what which way you decide to do it. You've got the date and then you've got Glasgow or and then Botanic Gardens or flowers or whatever else. The, the biggest thing is it's going to be personal to you. So come up with what works for you. Mm. Give it a wee bit of thought and then then go with it. Yeah. Worst case scenario, if you're using something like Lightroom and it's images, you can you can batch rename. Yeah. So that's quite handy too. Yeah. So I mean, Brian's added as well. Trying to include name, um, name, date, slash type for document makes for long names. So I've actually been... We were talking about scanning stuff, so I've actually been trying to get rid of all the ring binders. I've got all the documents in from 18 years ago when I started doing my family tree. And as I've been scanning things, I have broken my family tree down into family numbers. So I've got P, P1, P, and, and, then, and then M for maternal side. So I've got the family numbers and a spreadsheet that tells me what family number relates to what couple so you might have a family that you're born into then you might have a family when you're married and the documents relating to that family are in their folder so i then have within that folder um birth and then a space or a dot and then the year and then a dot and then i have surname and capital and then the, the, the christian name and and a uh, lowercase so really, it's just about, you know, I mean, I worked in admin, so I suppose I'm, I'm a bit OCD. <laughs> I, designed, I used to design filing systems for a living, so <laughs> I suppose I'm a bit OCD about doing things like that. But Yeah, you know, so another, another, aspect, another aspect you've got is we don't have quite as much of the problem that we used to have, that if you put them in folder after folder after folder after folder, it then can't read it when you then put long file names. Mm-hmm. So longer file names aren't as much of an issue now. Mm-hmm. But use use the metadata tags if you can do them. Uh, right click properties. There are there's tools out there that you can put yeah. a bulk update onto your metadata. I wouldn't be too worried about the length of the names, but if you choose it's Glasgow, go GLA. Um there's, so there's I mean, ways of doing it. So uh, you could just use the the air, the closest airport naming convention. Uh, there's three digits. Yeah, when, works for when, you. It come, when it comes to family history, you know, your actual family pictures of people, mm. I've just got mine named P and whatever the number is. And then I've got a spreadsheet, I love a spreadsheet. So I've got a spreadsheet where, you know, you'll go down to P1 relates to, and, it, and I'll say it on, it gives you space then to put from left to right, it's, you know, great aunt, aunt Agnes and then great aunt Mary and, you know, cousins such and such 
And then at the end of that, I can put what family numbers it relates to as well. And if you've got people with common names, I just put in brackets, born, whatever year they're born, so that you know, because you've got to kind of think, you know, I know when I read that who these people are, but then if somebody else picks that up when I'm no longer here, it needs to be in a format that, that somebody can pick up and go, right, okay, that's self-explanatory and I know how that works. So, I mean, or I mean, you or you put one of your cheat yeah. sheets in every single folder, yeah. even if it's a, a .txt file, just something really simple to say, P1 means this, P2 means this. Yeah, yeah, I know. Does so that Margaret help? Says, Margaret says, I hope that helps, Brian, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do a, a, a presentation sometime in organising your, your files, because, yeah, let's face it, there's so many photographs, so many documents and notes everywhere, yeah. Yeah, the summer sessions um, would be a good one for you because that's all about organising and sharing. Um, Brian says, good idea using numbers. My issue is deciding the primary search list, surname or BMD. I, I know. I start with one method, then change to another. <laughs> okay, don't, don't, leave it with oh. me, Brian. Brian, you, <laughs> might, you might actually find the summer sessions um, of use because that talks about organising your research with Trello. We've got sharing and organising. Um, let me just put the, the link for that back into the chat um, because, the, yeah, there's blogging. There's all sorts of different things about sharing and organising your family tree because we asked Christine and myself, all our followers and everyone in the groups, what they needed help with. And that was the thing that came up was getting organised and how to share your research. So check that out. As I say, it's £10 for four sessions throughout July. They are recorded, so if you miss it, 